Alright, let's discuss the moon. Mostly because in the last few months there's actually been some really exciting discoveries from the surface of the moon and even some discoveries that basically nobody expected. Discoveries that are now becoming even more important because the US government and by extension NASA seems to be very serious about going back to the moon in the next few years. As a matter of fact, even recently, one of the more unusual propositions was in regards to a new policy for the formation of various types of standardized time systems for various objects outside of planet Earth, with the moon currently being the main target for the so-called moon standard time. An attempt to basically create a standardized time system that can be used on the moon and beyond, with Mars obviously being the next target. It's actually going to be known as LTC or coordinated lunar time and it's going to become a standardized system that's actually going to rely on something else, Einsteinian theories. And that's because we know that on the moon the time actually does flow just a little bit differently. Because the moon's gravity is much lower, technically in the last 50 years since the last Apollo mission, the time on the moon has lasted for approximately 1.1 seconds longer. So obviously a super insignificant amount for humans but a very significant amount for various types of technologies we're going to be using on the moon. And so just like the GPS system that relies on the adjustments of these relativistic timescales, the moon is going to be doing the same. But based on some of the most recent calculations, the actual time difference right now is not entirely clear. There's still about one millionth of a second of uncertainty. But by 2026, when NASA is planning to launch astronauts to the moon, most of this will probably be clarified. You can find some of these initial studies in the description below. But apart from figuring out the time on the moon, the scientists are also trying to figure out the mystery of its extremely thin atmosphere. It's more technically known as exosphere, and it's essentially an extremely thin and very low in density layer of gases that seems to be present on the surface of the moon. Although naturally, calling this an atmosphere is maybe not entirely correct. Here the density is so low that it's actually kind of comparable to what we find around the International Space Station. So here on Earth we would actually call this vacuum. But for the Moon this is still an exosphere, mostly because of the way it's produced. A lot of the previous analysis established that it seems to contain a lot of sodium and a lot of potassium and quite a lot of unusual gases. As a matter of fact, gases that are usually not found in typical atmospheres like on Mars, Venus or Earth. For example, it seems to contain things like rubidium, which though easily vaporized, is not something we find on Earth. And so here the biggest question was, ok, but what's actually keeping this exosphere from completely evaporating? Mostly because we know that the solar pressure and various charged particles coming from the Sun should have already stripped all of this a long time ago. And since the Moon doesn't actually have magnetosphere to protect itself like our own planet, something else must be maintaining this exosphere through some other means. And so here by analyzing some of the older rocks from one of the Apollo missions, the researchers focused on potassium and rubidium isotopes and essentially correlated them to various micrometeorite impacts that we know always happen on the Moon. Essentially suggesting that it's really these tiny micrometeorite impacts that seem to continuously replenish lunar exosphere and seem to continuously vaporize lunar dust, releasing all sorts of unusual atoms, which then form the exosphere of the Moon. And here they were further able to show that during meteorite showers we actually see more atoms of atmosphere, implying that there's a direct effect. On top of this, when the Moon is shielded from the Sun, such as for example during some kind of an eclipse, there are also detectable changes in the presence of various atoms, which suggests that the exosphere is maintained by both the Sun or the solar particles and micrometeorites coming from outer space, which potentially solves this unusual mystery of the lunar atmosphere. But then we have another mystery, this time from the ground. And it's the mystery that you can actually see if you have any kind of a telescope that's able to see the lunar surface. On the surface there are these unusual lunar swirls. Strange looking formations that seem to contain both dark and light patches and very often appear relatively young compared to the rest of the area. Now the most well known and the one that's actually easiest visible is what you see right here known as Reiner Gamma. NASA is actually going to be sending a rover here in 2025, hoping to collect some samples and to essentially figure this out. But even today, nobody actually knows exactly how any of this forms. There are obviously several propositions, but no one explanation that everybody agrees with. Nevertheless, there's one feature that really stands out here, 
and that potentially explains what's going on. These unusual features are always associated with various magnetic anomalies. Maybe this magnetic anomaly protects soundless area from the solar wind, preventing space weathering, and preventing the area from looking older and from becoming darker. And if so, this would actually be an incredible discovery, because this could be a perfect spot for a potential colony. Obviously, because it would provide some protection from outer space radiation. But additional explanations involve the idea of maybe dust levitating differently and basically being deposited along the magnetic lines in such a way that it just appears much brighter on one side. Likewise, it was also suggested that maybe these are just cometary impacts. And though right now there is obviously no one explanation, we now have additional observations that provide additional clues. And the answer potentially is magnetic after all, but for maybe different reasons. And so what exactly is the answer then? Well, we know that the surface of the Moon does actually contain a lot of these miniature magnetic pockets, very likely the result of ancient volcanism, that deposited certain concentrations of certain things in various locations. So, for example, maybe some locations would have a much higher content of various metals that would form certain magnetic properties in certain regions. And so in this case, the light shaded areas have indeed coincided with certain localized magnetic fields. But on top of this, interestingly enough, there's also a correlation with topography. These brighter areas are actually not on the same level as the darker areas. The bright stuff is approximately a few meters lower than the dark stuff. And this of course suggests that something underneath this might also play a bit of a role. And so the results from one of the recent studies in a description presents us with a kind of a complex interaction of multiple underground processes. And specifically, it seems to connect to various underground magmas that potentially cooled in a magnetic field that used to be present on the ancient moon that then solidified as a kind of a magnetic anomaly. And here in the study, there seems to be a lot of radar evidence for underground flowing molten rock. And specifically rock that seems to be enriched in a mineral known as ilmenite. A titanium iron oxide that's often found in volcanic rock that seems to be responsible for this magnetization effect and seems to be present in these ancient underground volcanic rivers, with various volcanic flows forming certain regions that assume certain shapes, then forming these bizarre swirls. And so in essence, this seems to be the result of underground volcanic activity. And it's actually this volcanic activity that a lot of space agencies are now super interested in, for one simple reason. It possibly provides a perfect location for a potential colony once again. But unlike here, where the astronauts would still be exposed to a lot of elements, a lot of recent studies and a lot of recent interest has actually been in regards to lava tubes. The locations on the Moon that we know for a fact seem to be very similar to the ones on Earth. And in this case, these lava tubes potentially represent ideal places for some kind of a research station or even a prominent man colony. And the reason why they're so exciting is because of the protection they offer. Here, the astronauts and essentially the entire colony would be protected from practically everything. Cosmic radiation, micrometeorite impacts, and even temperature fluctuations, as the temperature inside these tubes is generally kind of constant. And so very recently, by using the iconic Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been collecting data since 2009, the scientists reanalyzed the data from its Mini-RF or Miniature Radio Frequency Instrument that allowed them to recreate one of the potential tubes in the location of Mare Tranquillitatis. And here they found an evidence for an extending cave that seems to expand horizontally from the base of the entrance and even has an extremely flat floor that can be used for various constructions. And because at least 200 similar entrances seem to exist on the surface of the Moon, humanity might have to go back to live in the caves, although in this case for maybe slightly different reasons. But naturally, NASA is not the only one interested in this. As a matter of fact, several announcements from China seem to suggest they're planning a robotic system that's going to explore one of these caves possibly even the one from this study, in the next few years. And the robot they're building might even be able to fly, allowing it to autonomously descend into the tube in order to then scan it from inside. Which once again suggests we might have a new lunar race after all. And so I guess let's see who makes it first. Although interestingly enough, in one of the other studies from China, they analyzed one of the recently retrieved Chang'e 5 mission samples, revealing several incredible things about them that could dramatically help 
future colonies, settling in these lava tubes. And here this was a sample that seemed to contain a mineral similar to what's known as Nova Grablinolite, a type of a volcanic mineral that we usually find on Earth directly associated with volcanoes and, of course, volcano tubes. But interestingly, in this particular sample, 40% of it was basically water. And so this unusual mineral, potentially present near a lot of lunar volcanoes, seems to be an excellent source of water. And in this case, it wouldn't even take much to try to extract this. According to the scientists, these minerals just have to be heated to approximately 100 degrees Celsius in order to collect the water. And so in some sense, maybe settling in these lunar tubes is actually a great idea. And something else was discovered in a very similar sample from the same mission by a different team of scientists. Here they found various iron compounds that are usually associated with the formation of graphene. And when analyzed further, a lot of carbon in this sample was actually in graphene form after all. Graphene that could have formed during volcanic activity or maybe as a result of meteorite impacts. And because there is a lot of interest in graphene today, this is of course a really exciting discovery as well. But maybe not for the reasons you think. In other words, it's not because we can mine it. Instead, this actually presents us with potentially an alternative easy way to create graphene by basically learning how it was formed in these rocks. In other words, the sample presents us with a potentially new way to develop graphene that's possibly much more effective and even cheaper than a lot of modern techniques. And because graphene is becoming more and more important for various nanomaterials, this could maybe lead to new discoveries after all. But I guess the important takeaway message is that there is now a lot of interest in the moon once again, and both China and US are slowly turning this into a somewhat exciting race. A race that has a very high chance to potentially discover new technologies that are most likely going to benefit everyone right here on planet Earth. But I guess where all of this goes in the next decade, only time will tell. And so until then, check out some of the previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.